Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Lando. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Spravato. Spravato is a nasal spray. It contains esketamine and it's for treatment resistant depression. It was approved by the FDA in March of 2019 and it's a relative of the intravenous anesthetic ketamine that was originally approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 1970. It's actually a relative of PCP. It's a new drug and it's a new concept for treatment resistant depression and it's to be used in combination with a traditional antidepressant. The drug was granted breakthrough status in 2013 on the basis of promising trials, phase two trials, and it seems to meet a need that we don't really have any great therapy for. It's used as an intranasal spray only under the direct supervision of a health care provider. This medicine is not available for purchase at a pharmacy. You do not use this medicine at home. The way the therapy goes, weeks one to four is called the induction phase. It's twice a week therapy. It starts at 56 milligrams for the first dose. All other doses are either 56 or 84 milligrams. You do that twice a week for the first four weeks and evaluate at the end of four weeks whether the therapy seems to be working. If it's working, go on to the maintenance phase, weeks five through eight. Continue at the same dose, 56 milligrams or 84 milligrams, but now it's weekly. And after eight weeks, you can even decrease it to every other week. An essential part of the therapy is the oral antidepressant. Now you use a new antidepressant, one that you haven't been resistant to. And the antidepressants that they used in the study were the generic forms of either Cymbalta or Zoloft or Effexor or Lexapro. You do not prime the device prior to use. You have the appropriate number of devices necessary for your treatment because each device contains only 28 milligrams of the spray. It delivers only two sprays, so you're going to require either two devices or three devices depending on your dose, 56 milligrams or 84 milligrams. You blow your nose first to clear it out. You recline your head backwards by about 45 degrees. You insert the device into the nose so that the skin of your nose rests on the device you certainly want to make sure that the medicine penetrates deeply into the nasal cavity. You don't want to spray it into what's known as the vestibule or the lower portion of your nose. You close the other nostril, you breathe in while you're pushing the plunger, you sniff gently to make sure the medicine goes into your nose, then you repeat it on the other side. You wait five minutes with a new device and you do it again. That's 56 milligrams dose. If necessary, if appropriate, then you go to the 84 milligram dose which is after another five minutes of rest. Now, there's a little green dot on the side of the container. There are actually two dots when the device is full. After one spray, there's only one green dot. And after it's sprayed twice, there are no green dots. Therefore, don't prime the device. You'll waste a dose. You avoid having food for the two hours before you use the medicine because of the possibility of nausea and vomiting, and you don't drink any liquid for 30 minutes prior to the treatment. Now, if you need a nasal steroid or a nasal decongestant, well, do that at least an hour before you use the medicine. There's a black box on the piece of paper that comes with it on the package insert. And it's there because there's a risk for sedation and dissociation after administration. So that means that you have to stay in the clinic for at least two hours after you use the medicine to make sure you're clinically stable. And the black box warns of the potential for either abuse or misuse. And especially in those people who have had problems with drug abuse, there is the potential for problems with this medicine. It may increase the suicidal thoughts or behaviors. That is listed on all antidepressants. However, Spravato is in the process of being evaluated as a therapy for depression. Now, it comes 
as uh, what's known as a REMS. That's a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. And that means that the healthcare facility where you receive the treatment has to be registered. You have to be enrolled in the program. The doctor has to be enrolled in the program. And it's only to be delivered in certified healthcare institutions, which is obviously going to cause a logistical problem if it's used in a psychiatrist's office, because psychiatrist's offices tend to be relatively small. And if you have patients with depression who have to sit around for at least two hours, that's an issue. Now again, it cannot be purchased at a pharmacy, should not be used in people who've had any kind of vascular problem in the aneurysm family. So if you have a thoracic aneurysm, if you have an abdominal aneurysm, an intracranial aneurysm, if you have a peripheral artery aneurysm, drug is not for you. If you have had a history of intracerebral hemorrhage or an arterial venous malformation, again, it's not for you because it can increase the blood pressure. So that means caution in people with a history of cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, because they may be at increased risk. So if your blood pressure is more than 140 over more than 90, consider the short-term gains and what would happen if your blood pressure goes up. The blood pressure has to be reevaluated 40 minutes after therapy. That's at the time of peak concentration. And then again, as necessary, to watch until the blood pressure starts to get back to normal seems to get back to normal by about four hours in most cases. In one in six individuals, the top number, the systolic pressure, may increase by more than 40 points, and the diastolic may increase by more than 25 points. Now, it does that at least once in the first four weeks of therapy in these one in six individuals, even at a relatively small dose, even if you've had the therapy previously at the same dose and you haven't had any problem. Now that requires immediate referral if you happen to have what we call uh, hypertensive encephalopathy where you have a very severe headache, you have visual disturbances and seizures, you have some decreased consciousness, or if you have a hypertensive crisis which means chest pain and shortness of breath, drugs should be used only with extreme caution or not at all in people who are receiving the MAO inhibitors or psychostimulants. And there are problems with cognitive impairment when you're using the drug. It can impair your attention and judgment and thinking and reaction speed and your motor skills. They're especially decreased about 40 minutes after you use the medication, seem to get back to normal after about two hours. But it means that you can't drive home right away. You shouldn't drive home and you shouldn't drive at all until you've had a good night's sleep after the therapy. So somebody has to drive you home from the clinic appointment or from the, wherever you happen to be receiving the medicine. And there's the potential for long-term cognitive and memory impairment with repeated use of ketamine or misuse or abuse of ketamine. But so far with Spravato, that hasn't been an issue. Now, an issue is sedation. There's 50, 60 percent of the people are going to be sedated when they use the medicine. They're going to be tired. That's why you have to be monitored for at least two hours, especially if you're taking any kind of a central nervous system depressant. And there's a dissociation reaction, which is the most common psychological effect that often lasts until about 90 minutes after the therapy and can cause a psychosis. Well, what is a dissociation reaction? You feel spacey or you're floating and you have distortion of time and space and illusions and visual disturbances and you might have trouble speaking or you might have confusion or suffer from numbness or feelings of dizziness or faintness, typical side effects in more than 10 to 20 percent include dizziness and vertigo and nausea, peculiarity of feeling and some people get headaches and abnormalities of taste, at least 15 percent suffer from anxiety and significant number from lethargy and vomiting. Some people feel drunk when they take the medicine and interestingly some people have suicidal thoughts for up to about four hours after the therapy. There are some issues about whether it might cause some urinary difficulties and in the studies in a relatively new drug there were six suicides. Three of the suicides occurred at four days, 12 days, and 20 days after the last therapy. And in two of those patients, they seemed to be doing phenomenally well. One of the persons seemed to be doing quite poorly. 
Three other deaths occurred, one at 26 days from a motorcycle accident, another at 113 days, another six months afterward due to a myocardial infarction. Now, the medicine can interact with central nervous system depressants. So you can get increased sedation if you happen to be taking a sleeping pill, a benzodiazepine, an anti-anxiety uh, medicine, an opiate, or if you're drinking alcohol, and it can cause a significant increase in the blood pressure, especially if you happen to be taking a psychostimulant. You're taking amphetamine or Ritalin or similar drug, or you're on an MAO inhibitor or modafinil. It's certainly not recommended if you are pregnant, can cause some skeletal abnormalities, and may significantly impair brain function, not for women who are lactating, not for the pediatric age group. If there's liver impairment, well, you have to monitor to see how you're doing because it will alter the metabolism if you have severe liver dysfunction or perhaps even moderate liver dysfunction. The way the drug works, we're not exactly sure. It seems to have something to do with the NMDA, the N-methyl D aspartate family, but we're not exactly sure that that really has anything to do with it. It seems to have something to do with the glutamine release, but whether those are really how the drug works, don't know. But it certainly seems to be different than the traditional antidepressants. Ketamine itself has two chemicals in it. They're called enantiomers, and they're mirror images. One is called the S-ketamine, the other is called the R-ketamine. The S-ketamine seems to be the active ingredient, and that's what the Spravato is. It's S-ketamine, E-S-K-E-T-A-M-I-N-E. S-ketamine is considered a controlled substance. It fits into the category three. Category two are the hydrocodone, oxycodone, fentanyl, methamphetamine family. The class four drugs, those are the sleeping pills, the benzodiazepines, the sleeping pills. So it fits in between the two. It seems that the more you take, obviously the more it gets into the system, but it's not directly proportional. So you don't get twice as much value at 56 milligrams as you did at 28 milligrams. It gets into the peak concentration in the system. Within about 20 to 40 minutes, about half of the drug is absorbed. It seems that there's significant inter-individual variation. So from person to person, the level that gets into the system can vary by a significant amount, 60% or so. And even the same person using the medicine at different times can have about a 10 or 15% variation in the amount that gets into the system have a rapid decline in the amount of medicine in the circulation after about two to four hours. The terminal half-life is about seven to 12 hours. The studies that were done, five of them were done, three short-term, two long-term, looked at about 1,700 patients. Only about 500 continued the medicine for about six months. Only about 180 continued the medicine for about one year. The doses studied were 14 milligrams, 28, 56, 84 milligrams. And the seem, it seems that the best therapy was at 56 milligrams or 84 milligrams. Now, treatment-resistant depression means you have major depression. You have an episode of major depression and you've had at least two therapies for the current episode, and you haven't improved. Well, when you start with the Spravato, you start taking a new antidepressant, as I said. It's either the generic form of the Zoloft or the Lexapro or the Effexor or the Cymbalta. Typical patient happened to be a 40 to 50-year-old Caucasian female. Studies were funded by the drug company that's responsible for the drug. One trial showed that the overall score on what we call the MADRAS, which is the Montgomery Asperg rating, depression rating system, uh, it seems that they improved by about 21 points. A placebo group improved by about 17 points. There were two trials that really didn't show any difference between the Spravato and the placebo. One showed no difference in people over age 65, and the other one showed only a slight improvement at a dose of 56 milligrams and no improvement at a dose of 84 milligrams. 
So the Montgomery Asperg depression rating scale, it evaluates 10 different items. The clinician rates it on a scale of 0 to 60. Those are the scores that are possible. With the esketamine, with the Spravato, the most effect is at 24 hours. And between 24 hours and 28 days, both the group receiving the Spravato and the group receiving the placebo improved at about the same rate. So the major kick is in the first 24 hours. And most of the people, two-thirds of the people, received the dose of 84 milligrams twice a week. Now, if we look at the patients who were studied, these people had significant depression. They had moderate to severe depression. The score on the madras was 37, 38 on average. Now that's significantly worse than the patient treated with the traditional antidepressants. And overall, on the short-term trial, the 28-day trial, looking at 114 patients, they started off with a baseline of 37 points. The score at week four fell by almost 20 points, so the residual score was about 17 points compared to the placebo, 109 patients receiving that. They started off with the same baseline, about 37. They fell by about 16 points, so they had a final MADRA score of 21 and a half. So about several points different between the patient groups. Now, if we look at people who went into remission, so their score was less than 12 at the end of four weeks, or we, went, uh, we look at people who are in response. They responded to the therapy, but the depression didn't completely go away. Their score fell by at least 50%, but they weren't in remission. They weren't less than 12. And what's going to happen is those people can continue on the therapy, or they may be switched to placebo to see if the medicine really is doing anything on the long-term basis. And what happened is, within the first two weeks, of switching from the medicine to the placebo, there was a demonstrable effect. So among the people who were in remission, they actually saw their depression worsen in about 45% of the people receiving the placebo, but only in 25% of the people receiving the Spravato. What that means is that 25% of the people, even though they're still receiving the Spravato, still got worse. If we look at the people who were in a stable remission, so they had improved by at least 50% on their MADRAS score. In the placebo group, they flared in almost 60% of the people, as opposed to about 25% who continued to receive the therapy. So overall, the therapy seems to work, and it works in about half of the people who are taking the drug. Now, the withdrawal study was a little bit fuzzy because you have all the symptoms associated with taking the drug. So when you switch to placebo, the people knew that they weren't receiving the active drug. So they didn't have the sedation, they didn't have the dissociation. So how much the end result is really a result of the patient unblinding? That's that's an important issue in medicine and medical trials. And the studies were looking at people who would tend not to be the worst people, the worst people most unlikely to respond. So these people didn't have other psychiatric symptoms, they didn't have bipolar disease, they didn't have obsessive compulsive disease, they didn't have histrionic or narcissistic or borderline personality, they weren't autistic and they weren't homicidal or suicidal. Well, treatment-resistant depression is a significant problem. Depression itself affects about 16 million people in the United States, and a quarter to a third of them have the treatment-resistant form. Treatment-resistant form means that they haven't responded to the SSRIs, drugs like Prozac, or the SNRIs, or the tricyclic antidepressants, or the MAO inhibitors, or the atypical antipsychotics. And all of those drugs anyway take weeks to months in order to give or provide relief, as opposed to Spravato. And with Spravato, the improvement comes within hours to days. It's among the most effective therapies for treatment-resistant depression. The problem with depression, of course, is that many times, especially when it's treatment-resistant, people are unable to work, they can't maintain the relationships, 
They can't attend to self-care. Oftentimes they might have to be hospitalized. They can be suicidal. They can have medical complications of depression like cardiovascular disease. It's estimated that people who have significant depression, especially treatment-resistant depression, may lose 10 years of their life. The only drug that's been approved specifically for treatment-resistant depression to date, other than Spravato, is a drug called Symbiax. And Symbiax is a combination of fluoxetine, which is Prozac, and olanzapine that's Zyprexa. The other kind of therapies where you can switch antidepressants, you can add a new drug, the Symbiax, as I mentioned, or sometimes people off-label use the antipsychotic drugs, drugs like Seroquel or Rexalti. Sometimes you add or you change the type of psychotherapy. Electroconvulsive therapy, now called simply ECT, is actually pretty good. There's transcranial magnetic stimulation and vagus nerve stimulation. Some people improve with lithium or thyroid hormone. And now we have esketamine or Spravato. Now there's especially compelling evidence that this drug might work especially in suicidal patients, which is a problem in prisons and in psychiatric wards and hospitals. The FDA is considering whether it can license the drug for that particular indication. Now the skeptics say, well, there's a lot of hype around the drug. The effectiveness is vastly over-exaggerated. We don't have any long-term use. Another medicine in the same kind of family that works on the NMDA receptor in a slightly different manner seem to, in phase two studies, do very well. Treatment onset within one day, sustained effect, but phase three trials uh, didn't show any difference from placebo. That was rapastinil, never made it to market. It's gone as of March of 2019. Well, the difference between therapy with Spravato or esketamine and placebo seems to be about the same as we get with any of the antidepressants. It's only about three or four points that separates the people. The success, remember, was present in two studies, but it seemed to fail in a couple studies, and it used the MADRAS, the Montgomery Asperg rating scale, but some of the other rating scales didn't seem to do so well on. The drug itself came to be in 1962 when it was synthesized by Park Davis, which is a big pharmaceutical company, as a derivative of PCP. Actually, it was a model for schizophrenia, caused psychosis, increased the release of dopamine. Then in the 1990s, a government scientist found that maybe it could act as an antidepressant. And that led to some studies in 2000 at Yale University in the Connecticut Mental Health Center. They looked at seven patients treated them with IV ketamine, and four of the seven patients had a 50% decline in the rating scale that they were using for depression. They were using the Hamilton rating system. And the patients within two hours had symptom response. Then 2006 at the National Institutes of Mental Health, IV ketamine again, the despair lifted within hours and on the day after therapy, 71% of the patients had responded and 29% were in remission. And that led to the breakthrough status in November of 2013 on the basis of the intravenous study. But during the time from, nine, from 2013 on, well, there were hundreds of clinics that were set up around the United States that were giving the IV ketamine. Patients were paying out of pocket, they were receiving the medicine, and they were doing quite well. Well, it was finally decided that the drug company would produce esketamine as an intranasal product. It seemed to be more practical than intravenous therapy. It seemed that the pills might undergo first-pass metabolism, be rapidly broken down in the liver. It's a small molecule, so if it's inhaled, it gains access to the nasal mucosa and it can drain, drain directly through the systemic veins into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. Or maybe, I'm not sure, maybe it's absorbed into the nerves, the olfactory nerve at the top of the nose, and then it can gain access to the brain that way.
Well, there is some potential. Obviously, if it has to go in through the nose, you have to make sure that you don't have significant inflammation or polyps in the nose or significant septal deviation that's going to alter the vasculature and you have to uh, use the medicine appropriately. It has to get to the right area in order for it to be absorbed. Now, under normal circumstances, the Food and Drug Administration requires two short-term studies and then a withdrawal trial. Withdrawal trial often comes after the marketing, after it's been approved. Well, here, it only had one short-term study that was used and then the one slightly longer relapse study. The studies were done in multiple sites 40% of the time in the United States rest in Western Europe. And there's a question about some of the legitimacy of the withdrawal trial, especially the study that was carried out in Poland. So we're not exactly sure that the statistics are what they seem. Now, in 1970, the Food and Drug Administration approved ketamine as a dissociative anesthetic. Off-label, it's been used for a complex regional pain syndrome, and chronic pain syndromes, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and even for bipolar disorder. And in the 1980s, up to the 2000s, it was a very popular club drug called Special K, or Vitamin K, or Super K, or Jet, or Super Acid, or Green, or Purple. Unauthorized dose, low dose associated with relaxation called K-Land higher dose, unfortunately, K-hole, when a person had an out-of-body or a near-death experience. It caused a decreased memory and problems with learning, left people helpless and confused, seemed to have difficulty with balance, numbness, weakness, impaired vision. People were vulnerable and they lost touch with reality. Some of them had even aggressive or violent behavior. The recreational dose was only about 15 or 20 percent below the anesthetic dose in the mid-2000s. It was a significant party drug and in fact it was used throughout the world and it had such rapid abuse in China that they made it a class one drug because it was the third most common illicit drug that was found in people who were driving under the influence. Club drugs, they used it as uh, intranasal spray or intravenous or intramuscular. It's manufactured by Renaissance Lakewood, and it's sold by Janssen, which is a division of J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson. The wholesale price for the first month, according to the company, kind of expensive. The cost for the first month is between $4,700 and $6,700. In other words, the cost is about $170 to $240 a day of therapy, considering 28 days in the month. After the first month, the treatment can fall, the cost can fall, because you're not getting it twice a week, you're getting it once a week or every other week, so the cost subsequent to the first month is anywhere between about $2,300 and $3,400 per month. In other words, $84 to $120. Company estimates that they're going to have sales in the relatively near future that are going to be somewhere between two and a half and three billion dollars. Now, just to contrast that, I said it came out as an intravenous drug for anesthesia. So for 5,000 milligrams, a doctor can purchase the drug for $41. $41 will give you 59 doses at 84 milligrams or 89 doses at 56 milligrams. So in other words, you get half a year of the therapy from that $41 bottle of intravenous ketamine. Compare that $41 to the cost from Janssen. It's about $23,000. Now, how does all of this fit in comparing it to the antidepressants that are going to cost, or you can go buy some Prozac, or you can go buy so many of the antidepressants for anywhere between $4 and $20 a month? Where does this drug fit in? Well, we don't know. It hasn't been around long enough to know where it's going to fit in. But we can say that for some people who have treatment-resistant depression, Spravato is going to be a very important therapy, a, a significant advance in the therapy.
And what it does is it tells us that there's more to depression than serotonin and norepinephrine, the chemistry that's involved with the traditional antidepressants. So we have a new avenue of approach. The avenue seems to be working pretty good. It's kind of early to say where it's going to fit in, but we can say that it's horribly expensive, especially when we compare it to the older intravenous therapy that combined the R and the S forms, the R form not being effective so much, the S form being effective, but in the old days, all those intravenous clini clinics, the patients were getting well, and the cost was relatively small. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.